This is not twitter.com or x.com. This is a clone that was created using the low-code design and development tool called Plasmic. This was built using the Postgres database and Subabase storage, and it's deployed to Vercel as a Next.js application. In this video, we're going to see how we built this. All right, let's first take a look at the finished product and pay attention to some details. So this was designed really closely after the real site. We wanted to demonstrate the flexibility and the extent to which you can really control every last pixel in Plasmic. It's a full-blown web design tool. This is actually a fully responsive site. So we can see on mobile, there's just a bunch of things that are laid out differently or hidden. Now, when you first go to the domain, you can find a publicly accessible site, even for anonymous users. You don't have to log in. You can just start browsing tweets. But everything looks a little bit different than what you would see when you're logged in. Tweets can include text, but also media. When I hover over a user avatar, I can see the preview card for that user, and I can click through to get to their user page. And of course, I can click into a tweet to check out the tweet thread where I can see the previous messages that it was replying to, as well as any of the replies to it. And I can also reply from there as well. Anyone can sign up with a new account and log in. Once you log in, the first thing you're going to be forced to do is to set up a profile. We require you to do this before you can continue. So if you try to click through to some other pages on the site, they're going to redirect you back to this page first. And now you can see a personalized feed where you can post and take actions. I can like a post. I can repost a post. I can go to a user page and decide to follow them. And last but not least, I can write a post where the text editor is growing as we're writing more text. I can also upload some media where I get a preview. And I can write this from the home feed or from any other page. I can use this compose button where I'll get a pop-up where I can start writing my tweet. So how does all of this work? It all starts with data. So here we have a database that's set up in Postgres. And if you want to set up a Postgres database, you can use a provider like Supabase, which is nice because it has a visual editor built in for creating your tables without writing any SQL or code. But here we have a table for our users. So this is just you know their profile information. We have a table for our tweets, which the users are authoring. And we also have tables for follows, likes, and finally, a view called Tweet Details. And this just joins together the tweets and users tables. And this lets us keep the queries in the app a little bit simpler. Now, I usually like to start with the data, build out the skeleton, and then apply the styling and design later. So I'm going to add a query for our database's tweets table. And I'm just going to preview what that looks like. And from here, I can add filters to get at the exact data that I want. But another thing I can do is just drop down to writing custom SQL queries. So we can write a query like this, where we are grabbing all the tweets that were authored by somebody that the current user follows, because we have access to who is a currently logged in user. And we're going to sort that in descending order. Now that we have this query, I can start building the page. And I'm going to start by adding a vertical stack. This is just basically a box. And inside of this box, we're going to put in some text. So let's put in one text for the user's human name. I'll duplicate this to show the user's username. And one more for the body of the tweet. Now I want one of these boxes per tweet from our query. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat this element according to data. And the data that I want is that tweets query that we just issued. So now we have one box per tweet from our query. Now I can select this hard-coded text, and I can use what's called dynamic values in Plasmic to wire it up to some dynamic data. So I can say this text element, I want it to reflect the current item's human name. For this next text element, I'll do the same thing. I can also just search for the field I care about. And lastly, for the body of the text. I can find it here. So this is the skeleton of the home feed. One more thing we'll add is an image for the avatar of the user. So we'll set this to something like 48 by 48. And we'll bind it to the 
avatar URL in the user. And lastly, we'll add a rounded quarter radius. From here, we can start grouping these into nested horizontal and vertical stacks. And this lets us start crafting the layout to look a little bit more like the reference app. So you can keep designing and building out the tweets until they look more similar to the real app. Now let's switch to the user page. The user page is very similar to the home page, except that in the URL, it takes a username. So you can plug in any username and you'll get back the information about that user and their tweets. So there's this dynamic variable here, the user, and it's really similar to the home page, except that this query that's grabbing the tweets in it, we're going to incorporate that username. So we're looking for just the tweets that were authored by that user. And again, this is basically chosen using a dynamic value, which really powers everything in Plasmic. And so that's how we're substituting it as part of this SQL query. We also have another query, which is just grabbing the general information, like the bio of that user so that we can display it at the top here. So there's lots of parts of the UI that are reused. For instance, these tweets are showing up on both the home feed and the user feed. And also within the tweets, we have these buttons, these action buttons that are being reused as well. So that introduces us to components in Plasmic. That's a really important part of Plasmic is building UIs out of these composable parts like Lego blocks. So you can build bigger and bigger and more complex parts of the UI out of smaller parts. And that's what allows you to build eventually a whole application like this at scale and still keep your sanity. Even things like our avatars, they aren't just an image. They're actually an image that also is a link that takes you to the profile page. And it also has a hover interaction that shows the user card. All these components, they take props. So in the case of this tweet component, it takes some tweet data that we can pass in. When you create these components, you can define what props they take. So far, we've been looking at how we can display data, but we also want to let the user take action. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a look at these action buttons. So if I double click into editing this tweet component and we select one of these action buttons inside of it, each of these action buttons, it has a setting called on click. And this is called an interaction. This lets us specify some set of actions to run whenever the user clicks on it. So for instance, we want to create a row in the table of likes that tracks this particular tweet and the fact that the user clicked on it. We only want to run this if the user has not yet liked the tweet. If they have, then we remove that row to remove the like. One other really important action that a user can take is to post. So if we look at the UI for how that works, we have this text area and this is set to auto growth height as the user types. A text area is an example of an interactive component in Plasmic. And interactive components, they can have state. So the state of this text area, which is called its value, is just whatever the user has typed in so far into the text area. And we can actually inspect all the state on the page from the component data tab. Uh, if we reveal, we can see that text area is one of the pieces of state and it has an empty value right now. But if we just flip on interactive mode, so this lets us start interacting with the page that we're working on without um, switching away. And I can start typing hello, we can see hello showing up as the value state of that text area. Um, so this is just a way for us to debug the current state of this app. Now, we also have this post button. So this has a an on-click handler and there's a bunch of stuff going on here, but the main thing is this create row in the database. And we're creating a, a tweet whose body is that text area's value state that we were just looking at. So whatever the user has typed in, we're using that as the tweet body. And we can just pick this using, again, the dynamic value picker. We also have other data being filled in. So the user ID, which is the author of this tweet, is just the currently logged in user. And we're also tracking whether this is a reply to some other tweet. And we also have this media URL. And this is basically the uh, uploaded image that the user has attached. This upload is being done in 
one prior step. So right before the database create, we are running this superbase storage step. And this is what's actually uploading the file. Now, how does this work? So off to the left here, we have this upload component. And the upload component is just like the text area, another built-in interactive component. This is how you can choose files on your computer and upload them. It's just your standard upload widget. Uh, but inside of it, you can put whatever kind of button you want. And in this case, we're just putting these um, action buttons because that's how the actual app works. And then if we go back to the post button in the on click handler, if we look at that upload step, we're basically uploading that file to a random path. This is just a randomly generated UUID. So everywhere in Plasmic that you can insert a dynamic value, you can either pick data like this, and this is a, a simple way to get at data, which works for a lot of different cases. But for those times where you need or just want to write some custom code, you can do so and just write in a little snippet of JavaScript. For the actual data that we're uploading, we're writing some code for grabbing the state of that upload widget. So this is how we can grab the file content. So there's one more important page, which is this post page. And the way this works is it has this pattern of URL. And so there's basically this tweet ID that comes at the end of the URL. And that's how we're going to determine which tweet are we actually going to fetch, which tweet is kind of the, the highlight that we're interested in. And we grab that tweet along with all the related tweets. So that includes anything that it's replying to, as well as any replies to it. And then we display that in the page. Here we can see that we're, we've inserted the new tweet component. So this was also on the home page here. So again, an example of how you can use the same component in multiple places, um, even though they're actually slightly different. Like when you post a tweet here, it's actually tracking that this is a reply to this tweet. That's because it takes a prop here, a setting, that indicates this is the tweet that we're replying to. In the case of the homepage, this is not set. So far, we focused on the functionality of the app, but the design is also very important for this example. Uh, Plasmic is a full-blown web design tool. It's used to create some really beautiful websites as well as apps, but this is a perfect example of the intersection of both, where you're building a an app with rich functionality as well as bespoke design. A lot of those design settings are in the design tab. So when you are selecting something, you can control its layout, its typography, the shadows and the spacing between all these things, the hover effects on the page for the buttons, the tweets, the action buttons, the nav, even the hover cards and the tooltips. One thing you can do in Plasmic is have a bunch of your pages share a common page layout. In our case, this includes the nav and any extra stuff on the right. Now this page layout is nothing more than just a component that also includes a slot. So this slot is just the main area here. We can basically fill in this component slot with any content that is specific to that page. One of the things we wrap around the slot is the loading battery. So this actually lets us design what the loading state of the app looks like as well. And here we're grabbing the spinner from the actual app. Components in Plasmic can also be created to have different variants that they come in. So a simple example of this is the button component. This is the same component being used here and here, but these are just different variants of the same component. So in this case, we've left it at the default color of black. And in this one, we have the color set to blue. These action buttons are another example, and it'll become more clear actually if we switch to editing that action button component in its own um, by itself. One really powerful thing in Plasmic is you can turn on design mode. And what this does is it'll show you all the different variants of the component laid out in different artboards. And you can just directly go to one of these and design what it looks like. So for instance, we can design what that hover state looks like for the for this button, where it has that ring around it that glows. Here's a variant that we created called stat. That just means we're displaying some stat next to the next to the button. 
Um, so we can design what that looks like, what the spacing is, etc. Um, there's different uh, sizes that we've defined here as well. And this is the filled variant for the compose button. I think that's the only place where that's used. Um, we have different shades of the button. So red and blue and green. Um, these are for the different actions like likes and reposts. And same thing with the post component as well. So this is the actual uh, thing that shows tweets. We can see all the different variants laid out side by side. So this is a normal tweet. And when we hover over it, we apply this faint uh, gray shading to the body. We also have this, um, this uh, replies variant where we draw a line under the avatar to signify that this post is connected to the next one that's about to show up below it. And we have a large variant. So this is what happens. This is what you see when you go to a dedicated page for a tweet and we're showing the main one larger than the others. The layout actually is a little bit different for this one versus the ones above it. Retweets come with some metadata about who is doing the repost and so on. So variants are a really powerful way for you to design what your app looks like in all of its different states. One special instance of variants is the responsive variants. So if we go back to the home feed, we can also turn on design mode here as well. And so we can see both the mobile and desktop versions of the page side by side. In Plasmic, you can actually have mobile first projects, which this project is an example of. So that's the default. And then desktop is the variant. So the nav bar, for instance, on the default mobile experience, it's this horizontal stack and we have this floating action button. But on desktop, we change it to be a vertical stack instead. And we reveal all the buttons and we change the compose button to be auto laid out instead of floating. One more thing I want to talk about is the difference between the logged in and logged out users. So for instance, we see this section if we are logged in, but if we're viewing as an anonymous user, then this actually gets replaced with different content where we are asking the user to sign in. And you can do this by choosing what role you want something to be visible to. So for instance, if we want this section here to only be visible to normal users, then we can choose this option in the visibility section. Twitter is a massive application with a lot more stuff that we haven't built out. So some stuff on the screen is just a static placeholder, but we just wanted to show the core functionality that really defines Twitter and make that part high fidelity. And the rest is really just continuing with more of the same. There's also other aspects of Plasmic that we haven't really tapped into. For instance, this app just uses the Plasmic federated login, but we can use our own custom login experience as well with a custom auth integration. And that's it. This is just scratching the surface of Plasmic. So far, we've shown how you can use the low code side of things, but one of the things that makes Plasmic really special is that it can integrate with code bases. And so you can hook this into your existing large React application and bring in your existing React components, even as building blocks to use within Plasmic or vice versa, creating new components that the rest of your code base can use. This bridging of no code and code is what lets Plasmic scale to very complex applications and what lets you truly build without limits. Please feel free to ask us any questions about this project in the comments section below or in the Plasmic Slack community. We'd love to see what you build.